All right, we are back, and now over to uh, Gary to get us started today. Absolutely, Passion. I'm Gary Tyron with Community Action Partnership, and I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be posted along with the slides following today's event. We will take questions at a couple of points in today's webinar, so please type those in the Q&A box at any time and select all panelists. This webinar is divided into three areas. First, Jeannie Schaffen, Director of the Office of Community Service, will provide a brief overview of asset building tools and strategies that agencies and partners can use and work with families. She will also provide a summary of key national resources. Second, Gretchen Lehman, Program Manager, Assets for Independence Program, will provide a summary of Assets for Independence and the new funding opportunity announcement. Third, Gretchen will turn facilitation of the webinar to Denise Devan, AFI Resource Center, who will introduce our community action agency leaders. These leaders will share stories of success and innovation, including the resources they have mobilized. We will begin the webinar with a poll. After the poll, Jeannie will begin. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. That poll is open. There's actually a four different questions, and if you could input your answers on the right. And with that, we are actually going to hand over to Denise to uh, get some introductions for today. Thank you so much, Cashin, and thank you everyone who has registered and is participating in the webinar. Our latest numbers showed 235 had registered, and including the speakers, we will be just shy of 250. Um, so I want to thank you so much. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeannie Chafin to you, and Jeannie, of course, is not new to the community action world. Those of you who have registered and are participating, many of you are executive directors or you are part of the state association network or you are program directors or you are fundraisers, and we have a few CSBG directors. Um, Jeannie comes to us um, from the National Association of State Community Services, or NASCAP, and before that was with the Missouri State Office and worked with CSBG in the Low Income Energy Assistance Program. And just a warm welcome and appreciation to you, Jeannie, for making the time to be with us today. And you should know that some of your old friends from Missouri are logged in. All right, Jeannie. Great, thank you. Uh, so pleased to be here today to talk to my community action colleagues around the country about asset development, financial capability, and really what I think is an exploding area that um, I want to make sure community action is tuned into uh, and, and really leading pioneering work uh, that's going on around the country. I want to thank um, Community Action Partnership for hosting the webinar today. They do such a good job of bringing really quality resources and information to the network, and we're just so thankful uh, for all that they do. Uh, I'd like to thank the Assets for Independence Resource Center uh, and Denise for uh, helping to put this together today. And then uh, the 230 some odd registered uh, community action uh, colleagues out there Thank you for taking, you know, a little bit of time out of a busy schedule and committing to learning and, and hearing more about what's going on in this space. Um, as uh, Gary said, I'm going to speak and then I'm going to hand it over to um, uh, a staff person at OCS that I have a lot of confidence and respect for and Gretchen Lehman is going to talk, uh, provide you with more detail than, than I can and a little bit more accurate information about how you could pursue assets for independence. And then what I'm really excited about and what convinced me to sign on to this task today is you're going to have an opportunity to hear um, from some pioneering agencies out there across the country who I think are doing some really great work in financial capability, asset development, and they're doing it from a community action perspective. And I think, you know, my work in Missouri or my work at NASCAS where I got to work with all the states, I always really valued hearing about what folks were already doing because when you can see it uh, and hear it uh, and hear colleagues uh, and what they're doing, I think it always makes it more real to you. So, so I really appreciate that. So. 
You know, I think, um, you know, an exciting thing that's happening uh, this year is we're really celebrating the, uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Economic Opportunity Act and over 50 years of really helping Americans uh, move out of poverty and climb up the economic ladder. And as we're doing this, I know many of you at your community action agencies in May will be commemorating the 50th anniversary, and we at ACF are, are, are doing some events to commemorate that. We're, we're really committed to not just looking back, but really thinking about what the future holds. And when I think about uh, efforts that are important to us in the fu future, I really do think about asset creation and financial capability. So I think this is a timely topic for us to be thinking about this year as we're, as we're looking at the future. Um, I'd like to just sort of begin to introduce the idea of financial asset building. I know many of you, many community action agencies, have been on the forefront of asset building and asset development from the beginning. When the Assets for Independence Act was first passed and ACS started funding demonstrations, there were many community action agencies um, that were some of the first applicants, and I know states like Minnesota have really been doing groundbreaking asset work for many years. Uh, but some of you may be newer in the network or newer to this topic, and we thought we'd just sort of provide a little bit of background this afternoon um, about why assets and, and what this is all about. And we've got a slide here where there are really two leading authorities on asset development um, put forward some really important quotes that I think really sum, sum up what we're trying to achieve. So the first one, uh, Ray Boschera, uh, who is now with the Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis, so you folks in the Midwest have, have a great resource there at the Federal Reserve. He's a leading thinker on this subject and has said, with in income we get by, but with financial assets we really get ahead. And I think we all know that in community action, we're always trying to strive to help our customers um, to not just get by, but really get ahead and move up and out of poverty uh, in a really permanent way. And assets and savings really help to do that, uh, as Michael Sheridan's quote also demonstrates. They help do that for the long term. Um, and it really puts people on a pathway um, to success when you begin to think about financial capability and financial assets rather than just thinking about income uh, and, and just, you know, helping somebody increase their income or establish an income. So um, thinking a little bit more about what we're talking about when we think about assets. So uh, maybe just go back one there. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, obviously you've got tangible assets uh, such as money, uh, real property, uh, you can also count machines and equipment, uh, bonds, stocks, and financial securities are the kind of tangible assets uh, that we often think about. We also want to think about uh, items such as intangible assets, such as your uh, credit and really your social capital, um, having connections uh, to different networks, uh, to different people in your community are also part of developing assets. And so uh, we, we um, think that these areas are all things that when we're talking about financial capability and asset development that we want to consider. Okay, I think we're on the right side now, slide. Uh, financial assets matter. Uh, and I think this slide does a good job of uh, talking about uh, the idea of just what what does asset development uh, really get us? What what kinds of outcomes and what kinds of positive change does that create for families? And so, um, moving away from just uh, paycheck to paycheck, but really thinking about long-term financial stability has a lot of positive outcomes for families. And some of the research uh, shows that. Uh, when families have assets and they save, it increases the likelihood uh, that children may go to college in that family. Um, there's some initial research being looked at that uh, demonstrates that, you know, it may increase community involvement. Um, it really has an aspirational impact on the family uh, and what 
family members may be able to achieve. So there are a lot of good benefits that come with thinking about uh, assets. So we really look at this as kind of a, a continuum. Um, the, we've got, in the beginning, I think, of, of asset development, we thought a lot about um, the kinds of assets such as purchasing a home or going to school, uh, maybe starting a small business. And the field has really developed now to where we're thinking about a continuum of assets. And you'll hear a lot of people talk now about the, you know, an asset um, uh, creating a uh, emergency uh, savings account, maybe uh, even considering the purchase of a car, an asset, and that folks really move along an asset development continuum uh, which would also include the standard things that we've, we've known historically about a house and an education and a business, but then uh, also saving for retirement. So we're beginning to think, and I think a lot of people in the field are, about asset development as a continuum. And when you think about the work of community action, you really, um, you know, you begin to see where community action agencies link up in many places uh, with this sort of continuum idea. And you certainly have a lot of different tools um, that folks can use to get uh, those assets and match savings uh, with AFI, uh, tax credits, building financial capability, um, uh, access to public benefits are all tools that help people um, to secure good assets for the future. So finally, I, I want to point you to the, um, the slide on in the asset building framework. And I think this is a really nice visual for some of the things that I've just talked about, that you know, we're not just looking at income, we're looking at savings, and that all builds and equals financial assets. And um, it's not just a job, but uh, it's saving, it's looking at tax credits, um, it's developing a range or a continuum of uh, assets that really puts people uh, on the path uh, up and out of poverty. And so today, what we're going to do moving forward is Gretchen is next going to talk about assets for independence or IDAs, which are matched savings accounts. And at the Office of Community Services, we have a funding opportunity um, where uh, local community agencies can apply um, to operate an Assets for Independence program. Many community action agencies did that. Um, I appreciate my colleagues in Missouri being mentioned. Missouri has operated a statewide Assets for Independence program for many years. And then, as I said, we're going to hear from uh, community action professionals and pioneers who are taking Assets for Independence and, you know, really bundling it with other services and I would say in some ways making it value added. And, you know, we think AFI is a great um, kind of strategy to add to other efforts um, and to bundle uh, with other services that you may be providing at your community action agency. I think we're, you know, really we are in the future moving into a time where it's really important for us to think about um, how we put services together and make them value added. There's not a whole lot of new money, uh, federal money coming down uh, the river, and so I think we have to think about the programs that we have and how to put them together in new and innovative ways. And I think AFI can be done um, uh, in, a, in a very robust way when packaged with other, uh, other programs, many of which community action agencies provide. So I'm going to hand it over to Gretchen Lehman, uh, who is our AFI program manager. And I have to tell you, I have to take a minute um, to, to appreciate Gretchen. Uh, she's been with us a short time, but has done more uh, at OCS for AFI um, than I think two or three people could have done uh, in, in a longer time. We stole her from uh, our, the department and our assistant secretary's office for planning and evaluation. She has um, a really strong uh, research and education background in asset development, so we're really lucky to have her. And uh, I know that she'll be a great resource for all my community action colleagues in this space. So. Uh, take it over, Gretchen. Thank you, Jeannie. That was that was very nice. Um, so my job here, and you can go. Um, there are some resources available on the slides too for for later reference for everyone. 
Um, so my job here really is to go into just a little bit more detail on the Assets for Independence program, although it's, you know, still not too much, and this, uh, you'll be hearing more details about some of the programs and, that are being run by community action agencies from themselves. Um, to, to go over the, the um, dates and key information about the new funding opportunity, and to really um, approach some of the things about the AFI program from this framework of if you wanted to apply, if you were thinking about applying, what are some of the questions that you want to think about in order before you even start putting together that application? Um, if you're considering adding the Assets for Independence program to sort of the work that you're already doing. So, um, go ahead. So, the Assets for Independence program is, as Jeannie said, is an asset building program that encourages low income individuals and families on the path to self sufficiency through matched savings accounts. And those matched savings accounts are called individual development accounts. Um, it was established in 1998 by Congress. This year, in FY 2014, we have about $19 million. Um, the grants are for a five-year project period and are often extended into a six. And um, there is uh, there are multiple funding cycles each year. There are multiple times during the year when applications are accepted. And we do allow organizations to have more than one AFI grant. So we, I'll be touching on that again later, but it's important to know that many successful programs do have more than one grant running at the same time and that you know, we would often encourage people to think about starting with maybe a very small grant um, to see how the program goes and then coming in later if things are continue to go well. Um, a key piece to note um, for all applicants is that um, the AFI program does require a 100% non-federal cash match um, for the amount of the AFI grant. So if you were to apply for $10,000 in the AFI grant, you would need to show that you have a commitment of $10,000 in non-federal cash match so that you could run then a $20,000 AFI project. Um, you can go to the next slide. So there are these, uh, right now there are about 300 organizations across the country that are running AFI projects. The, there's, the, the vast majority of them are 501c3 nonprofits. Um, state, local, and tribal governments can also um, apply, but they have to do that in conjunction with a nonprofit. And then there are some special types of nonprofits that we call out as far as CDFIs and low-income designated credit unions are also able to apply for the AFI program. Um, there's a link here where you can see uh, AFI grantees and where they're located if you're interested Maybe you're not uh, ready to apply for the AFI program yourself, but you think that an AFI program might be a good partner. You can see who's in your area. You can talk to other. You can also see what other community action agencies might be grantees. You can see, um, you know, and you can talk to them and reach out to them and learn more about their programs. Um, since it was started, um, you can see the numbers of sort of a total. We've had almost 90,000 families um, who have participated in the AFI program, which is a quite a stunning sort of accomplishment. Wonderful to see. Um, all right, so in thinking, you can go to the next slide. In thinking about applying, I, there's going to be a slide later with some questions on it, but there's, you know, I can present about how the, some of the specifics about the program, but there are certain things that you have to think about and coming together and, and how you might want to put together an application. And so I wanted to frame it in some of that way. So one of the things that we have within AFI is that there's, there are two models for how you might run the program. There's a single site where the, an organization, you know, they have the funding, they, they do all the recruitment, they have one, maybe locations, multiple locations because they have their own multiple offices, but it's really that one organization running the program um, as you would sort of typically think of a, a grant relationship. There's also a model with an AFI of having a network project where one organization might apply for and receive the funds, and then they work with other partnering organizations and actually, you know, in, in order to cover, for example, an entire state or a larger region, they may have um, organizations where they actually do a request for proposals and have a relationship with other sub-recipients that work directly with the participants. So there's a couple of different ways. If you were thinking about applying, you could think about how do I want to structure my project? How would I want to do this? What's a good model for me? 
And you don't have to necessarily commit to one forever. You could always change it later if you needed to. Another really key uh, piece of information about the AFI program is that our legislation is very specific about how the funds can be spent. And this has to do with both the federal funds and the non-federal match. They're put together into the project funds. And 85% um, of that funding has to go directly to the um, low-income participants match in their individual development account. At least 15% for um, sort of what I've been calling project operations. There's some um, different breakdown of those project operations um, based on our legislation, but it really does not leave a lot of money for things like staff and capacity and even sometimes things like the financial education that you might be offering to your participants. So we'll be talking more um, about the other kinds of support that organizations need to think about putting together and in thinking about other kinds of partners that you might want to put together for your for running a, a successful program. Um, but this is one of the areas where I think, and we'll hear this again later, but because of some of the funding that community action agencies get through the Community Services Block Grant, through other, other resources, in some ways it's been a really nice fit because they have other resources that they can use for administrative costs and, um, and better allows them to run an AFI program. And then, so the specifics on the funding opportunity, we have a, there's a, AFI has a, um, a three-year standing funding opportunity announcement. Today happens to be one of the uh, closing dates for the, for the applications, but do not be sure. There are many more listed up there, um, and it, it does take a while to, you know, to put an application together, so don't feel rushed. There, there are, we're, we're trying to hit, you know, at least two opportunities every fiscal year. It just so happens that for 2014, we have three in the calendar year. Um, and the, there's a link there that actually will take you to the funding opportunity announcement. The, there's a cap on, um, of a million dollars of a grant. You can't get more than a million dollars in one AFI grant. And the, the floor is 10,000. I think that that's, you know, most, you need enough to kind of have more than one participant, right? So, um, and then there's, there were some changes in this though for folks who have run AFI programs in the past or who've applied for the AFI program in the past. Um, this FOA was rewritten and there are some changes. So um, there have been a series of webinars that have been put out through the AFI Resource Center generally. And you can get, we'll have more information on those later, but there's some um, a webinar specifically that sort of calls attention to some of the changes in this FOA for those who may have looked at an earlier AFI FOA. So um, as we said earlier, the, the participants um, for an AFI program are saving money in match savings accounts called individual development accounts. And, the, and this is one of the areas, too, where there's a, there are some things that are set in the AFI program and there are some things that applicants or grantees have to decide. So um, there, are, there are three allowable assets that we that participants can save for. They can save for home ownership, um, post-secondary education or training, or um, capitalizing a small business. And they um, are, grantees need to provide access to financial education or um, classes and supports for their participants. And then the, one of the things that um, programs can de decide is what is the match rate that they want to offer to participants for um, for their match savings accounts. And actually, for programs can deserve, determine if they want to allow only one of the allowable assets or to have different um, offerings of those assets. Those are the three that are allowable through the AFI program overall. We do have some organizations perhaps that specialize in home ownership, for example, and they really want to focus on that. And so they've decided to only focus on that as an allowable purchase. So, so in looking at the requirements, there are certain things that are required and there are certain things that as you're thinking about who you would be serving if you were to apply for the AFI program and who you're serving now and if, and if the AFI program is a good match for the people that you're serving now, some of the questions that you would ask yourself are, do I have people who, have, who are interested in these asset purchases and who would be ready to start saving for those asset purchases and make them within five years? 
Um, and then on the next slide, another key piece of whether whether of evaluating your participants is whether they would be eligible for the program and also whether they would have earned income to deposit in their accounts. So there are a couple of um, ways of determining eligibility for the AFI program. You can see this on your screen and there's additional information at the AFI Resource Center. Generally speaking, um, most people, I think, uh, are determined eligible based on their adjusted gross income for the household and also on their net worth for the household. So you have to have a net worth of not over $10,000, and the adjusted gross income is tied to the annual HHS poverty guidelines. It's 200% for the household of the, of the annual um, poverty guidelines. So in thinking about whether the AFI program is a good match for you, part of it is thinking about, do is there a pool of participants who this program would be right for um, that I could access? So. So this is an overview sort of of what I was, the questions I was phrasing as we went through some of these, but so, you know, generally does the AFI grant fit the mission of your organization? As Jeannie talked about at the beginning, for a lot of community action agencies, it may fit very well in with what the work that you're doing. Um, then, but then thinking about do you have participants that are ready to start saving and, and have earned income and are eligible and are able to purchase a first home, start a small business, or get a higher education? And then if you've determined that, you're going to think about how you would design a successful project. Would it be network? Would it be single site? What kind of match rate do you want to offer? What kind of assets do you want to offer? And then in thinking about the partnerships in your community, are there, are there partners that you could leverage for this kind of a program, possibly for financial education or for other kinds of home ownership assistance programs? And then a really key one for almost everybody is, how will we raise the non-federal cash match as well as additional resources for administrative operations if they've deemed necessary? So then the last couple of slides as we have, um, there's some information that grantees give us on where they're getting some of their non-federal cash match and also project operation funds. As you can see, CSPG is listed there as a source for other administrative um, operations type funding. There's a lot of variation on where people are getting their non-federal cash match, a lot of foundations, some places are able to get it from state or local government, um, financial institutions. So these are some examples, and I know that the community action agencies that are on the webinar later will be talking specifically about what they've done in their cases. So I think that then the next slide should be the, yes. So um, as I mentioned earlier, through our, um, Assets for Independence Resource Center, we have a series of webinars that are available to anyone interested in applying for an AFI grant. And there's some dates up here and different webinars. You can always go online to the, the Resource Center, which is idaresources.acf.hhs.gov, and check on the calendar when webinars are planned. Um, and you can, you can take advantage of those and learn more about the specifics that we, for the application. I think now it's time for questions. Hello, Denise. Are you able to do questions now? I'm, I'm right here. Thank you so much. Jeannie and uh, Gretchen, thank you so much. You are just fabulous, both of you. And now we have time for questions. If participants would please use the chat box on the right side, you can type in your questions, and Jeannie and Gretchen can take some time to answer them now. And um, Cash, and I just want to check with you, are the lines muted or unmuted? Uh, yes, the lines are all muted, so all questions will need to be typed in. Um, and we have a couple that are already in the queue. Great. Maybe we could start with the ones in the queue. And I'm just um, coming, I can't see them. So could you read them, please, Cashin? Sure, we'll go back to the beginning here then. Ah, here it is, got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you ready or would you like me to go ahead and read? No, no, go ahead and read, please. All right, then. Um, are community action agencies the only type of nonprofits allowed to apply? Uh, we are, for example, a community development corporation. So for so the, the um, requirement is that they be a 501c3, um, not that they be a community action agency. So it, it's more based on your tax uh, status than 
on that definition. Thank you. All right, next up, um, I find with the electronic wallet, it ironically is harder for people to plan and budget. Money as a topic is different when not tangible, um, especially if you're trying to reach children. Mm -hmm. Good uh, comment. Uh, it is, it's no, an interesting comment. Sorry, Denise. Ahead, no, no, you go, please. So I, I, I'm uh, pleased that somebody mentioned children's savings because children and youth are really an area that's just exploded in the asset development world. And um, there are some barriers, I think, to using assets for independence for children or youth savings. As Gretchen mentioned, uh, you have to have earned income uh, in order to save. So that works for some youth who um, you know, may have part-time jobs, but it probably doesn't work for many children. Um, but there are a lot of other folks out there who are kind of demonstrating and experience, uh, experimenting uh, around children and youth savings, and I think that's really important. Um, also, we're doing a lot of encouraging and thinking about how children and youth can expand their knowledge about financial concepts, and we've um, through assets uh, for independence, a partnership that we have, we've been um, doing some work with Head Start programs, uh, working with parents and their children in Head Start on uh, savings and money management. I think that's a really, really interesting concept and uh, will look very different in four or five years. Um, I think mentioning my wallet, I, I'm assuming that uh, that's a reference to some of the uh, apps and the electronic tools that are out there now um, for uh, managing your finances. And, you know, I think back to when I started in community action and we talked a lot about budgeting. Um, we, we certainly weren't talking about electronic apps and, and helping people to use those tools. Uh, the whole field is, is changing significantly. You know, we don't call it budgeting anymore. We call it financial capability. Um, so I really hope agencies are looking at those kinds of resources and thinking about technology and um, how to use apps and potentially even um, some of the research that's coming out around behavioral economics and what prompts people to save, what prompts people um, to make wise decisions about money management. And, you know, as I said in the opening, I think there's just a lot of innovation and uh, a lot of potential in this field that I really, I really want to make sure that um, my community action colleagues around the country uh, uh, are paying attention to. Mm, good. There's a question here from someone who says that higher ed could be a, a technical school as well as a two- to four-year college. Uh, would it also apply to those who want to save for learning to be a chef? Um, Gretchen, do you want to speak to this one, please? It's the, yes. uh, the vocational? Yes. Sure. So the, the AFI legislation has some uh, specific requirements about the kind of institution um, that for post-secondary education and training, but it doesn't, but it, um, and so we can, it would depend specifically, I think, on where the person is going to chef school and that, and we, there would be some follow-up. We have to, it actually references some educational legislation, so there's often some cross-checking that we have to do for when grantees pose these specific questions, but, but in general, there are, you know, a number of vocational institutions that, that do qualify, and it's, it is not exclusively sort of the university system that, um, that qualifies for the post-secondary education and training. Mm, good. Thank you, Gretchen. Here's a good question from Laura Milton. How does one apply for a second AFI grant, and how does that look for programming? This is a good example of one grant and then another grant before the first five-year project is done. Do you want to, either of you speak to that? So um, the, the how is just you apply again, uh, but you would want to have, you have to raise a second, you know, it would, they need to be distinct sources of, well, not sources necessarily, but distinct pools of non-federal um, commitment. So, you know, you would have your one, um, project that's running that you've committed the non-federal source funds to, and then if you apply for another grant, then you would have to have another distinct non-federal commitment for that a second grant. And then, you know, what basically what ends up happening is that you have different projects in different sort of places in the life cycle. So if you have, um, many of our grantees are enrolling participants throughout multiple years, um, but 
So you may have, well, actually, I'll use uh, a university as an example. So that you may have, uh, you may have some participants that come back and enroll again in that second grant. Like maybe they have multiple years of, of school and they want to save for, for six months and pay part of their tuition and then come back and save for six months and pay part of their tuition. In order to do that, you would have to have them be in separate grants. They can't come back to the same grant to get another IDA. But you could have two grants that are running and you could enroll them in the second one. The other thing is that if you had a small grant and you fully enrolled and you had people who are progressing and saving over a longer period of time, over four years or something like that, then, you know, in order to recruit new participants, then you um, would need another grant. To, you know, there may be some people who drop out along the way in this first grant, but if you really want to be actively engaging and enrolling others, then you would have another second grant and you would just have people, you have potentially some cohorts where you have a group of people from your first project that are moving their way towards their sort of savings goals, while then you're recruiting and enrolling people for this next project that then would you know, move into their savings goals. So there's, it can look a variety of ways, but that's some examples. You know, uh, thank you for that, Gretchen. And as we listen to our community action professionals, they will, they'll offer some insights, too, about how they layer grants. So that's great, Gretchen. Thank you so much for that. There's a question here about CSBG. Can CSBG use, be used as a match? Can the state CSBG uh, manager, uh, you know, is this allowable? Um, or um, can you speak to that on, and CDBG? Um, can you speak to the requirements of the non-federal match, uh, Gretchen, please? So for so – for um, the way the AFI legislation is structured, it says that the only federal funds that can be used as the, quote, non-federal match are those which allow that usage within their legislation. So it can be a little bit of a tricky thing in going to learn about that funding source. My understanding is that the Community Development Block Grant, which is run by HUD, does have that sort of an allowance within its within its legislation. And there are some other examples of federal legislation that I think that if you were to go to the AFI Resource Center, that there would be some, some information about those that have, over time, people have researched and have developed some lists of that. Um, CSBG is not one of them, but Jeannie can talk about sort of some of the administrative um, uses for CSBG. So uh, I think one of the things that you will all be familiar of, those of you with community action, that oftentimes community services block plan is used very, very flexibly to support a range of strategies and infrastructure. So an agency may be using CSVG to, CSVG to support case management or financial education uh, at the agency. And so um, I think what some agencies do is they use CSVG for those sorts of supports for AFI um, participants, but it cannot be used as the um, cash, uh, uh, actual cash match. Um, I think that um, if you if you if you understand um, sort of the the rules around AFI, you can see that it could. Uh, it's very difficult to have AFI as a standalone program without any sort of other infrastructure. Um, so community action agencies obviously have a lot of other infrastructure um, and, you know, that can be used um, uh, for an AFI, to support an AFI project. So if you have more detailed questions about this, you know, you can reach out to our AFI staff or the AFI Resource Center and we can provide answers to that. Thanks so much, uh, both Gretchen and Jeannie. There's a really good question here about Head Start. What type of programs would you suggest that a Head Start program implement with an AFI grant since it must be targeted toward the parent with earned income? So um, I think we, we have some examples of that. So if somebody really wants some concrete examples, again, they should reach out to us and we can put them in touch with programs. But just sort of at a high level, I think if a Head Start program, particularly in a community action agency where there may be case management, financial capability, and other things being provided Head Start parents, would be very much suited um, to applying for uh, an AFI grant and really targeting their Head Start uh, parents as participants. So Gretchen mentioned really thinking about, you know, do you have participants who this is a need that they have? And I would say that a lot of 
Head Start parents would be suited for this. Um, and then through Head Start or the Community Action Agency, you might even want to supplement that um, with other resources um, and in uh, providing financial capability to um, the children in the classroom. And we've got a couple of pilots around around the country that we're working on that um, and kind of uh, try, trying to learn around that issue. Um, I'm a big proponent of all community action agencies really focusing, bundling, integrating a lot of services to their Head Start parents. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of this. As I mentioned in the beginning, we need to think about how to combine things so that they're value added. And um, if I were a CAP director in a community action agency, I would be thinking about how to bundle asset development and uh, education uh, and a whole range of things uh, for our Head Start parents because we have the potential, I think, with those families to break the cycle of poverty. One thing we don't have time to get into today is that um, the emergence around two generation projects and really trying to help parents develop new skills, it's called executive functioning, uh, that allows them to buffer toxic stress and trauma uh, uh, that their children might experience. And it, it really does have the potential um, uh, researchers are finding to uh, possibly break the cycle of poverty. And that's really, that's what we want to be all about in community action. And so I'm really excited about the potential that's emerging around some of this, some of this new work. Mm. And just being sensitive and respectful of your time, just a couple quick ones. Um, can the AFI grant be used for mobile homes, manufactured houses? Can they be purchased if a client is saving for a home? Um, so the this is one of those questions that I would uh, need to to follow up with someone on. Um, there's some there there are some specific sub questions that we would need to get into. So Denise, if you want to take those person's yep. contact information and provide it to me, that would be fine. Yep, great. Dennis, we'll get that from you and we'll make the connection. And then finally, um, the, Brad asked, the AFI grant, there is only 15% that's allowed for costs of running the project. That is, that is the honest answer that Gretchen said. Amy McAllister said, it's my understanding that education participation has to be at an accredited school. So back to the chef question. Um, if a participant wants to get an education at a CDL or, or a welding, but it's not accredited. Um, Gretchen, we may want to also get back with Amy about this education question. Right. So as I said before, there's some, there's some specific wording in the AFI legislation, and it refers us to then some education um, laws and regulations. So, you know, we often take this really on a case-by-case -case basis and sort of looking at what when a grantee um, comes to us. And there, and there should be some additional resources on the Resource Center, but we can also follow up with that, too. So um, it may be useful, Denise, for after the, the webinar for, some, for someone to go through some of the questions and see if there are certain ones that you want to forward on to us, because I do know that we yep. need to continue into the rest of the, to hear from the community action yep. agencies. Yep, we will. Thank you so much, Gretchen, and thank you, Jeannie, and our commitment to you from the AFI Resource Center will take these questions down and get them out. There are answers, and we just want to thank you for the participation. I think we could be going all afternoon, but Jeannie and Gretchen, just thank you so much, and we're going to turn now uh, to the leaders of our community action world who are going to be with us today. They have so many insights into what's been presented, and um, I'm going to ask you, Cashin, if you can let me move the slides, please. And then um, I want to introduce to you a couple of these folks. Um, first, I want to introduce to you um, uh, Angie Miller and Sarah Priest, who are from Community Action Duluth. Um, Duluth started with AFI-funded IDAs, but you will hear how they have grown and become the go-to uh, financial capability and financial empowerment center in, you know, in the Northwest, for sure, in Northeast, for sure, as well as other parts of the country. And they have, both of them have strong backgrounds. And I'm, here we go. Uh, each of them is going to talk about the partnerships. They're going to talk about sources of funding, cash and in kind. 
They're going to talk about the role of the CSBG office and the amazing support that they receive on the ground. They're going to talk to you about the success that they experience among their families and their youth and the success of their agencies. Many of them, their agencies have changed as a result of this work. Their staff has changed, and they've been inspired to keep growing and keep connecting and mobilizing. So um, this is, they'll, they'll let you know whether or not they're a network project, and we've got um, network projects in, I believe, in nine states, as you can see here, and then we have single site projects in all of these other states. So I don't want to take any more time. On, this is Angie, and this is Sarah. Uh, Angie is the executive director. Sarah is the director of the Asset Development and Financial Services kind of division for the agency. Angie, will you talk to us about um, um, financial capability, about IDAs, about what has happened in your agency and how one thing built upon the other in terms of where you are today? Oh, no. <laughs> Angie, are you there? Uh, she is actually tied to her phone line. Um, if she is able to hang up and dial back in with all three numbers, uh, we will be able to unmute her after that. But Sarah is on. Great. Hello, Sarah. Could you start and talk with us? We're having sure. a little technical problem. Thanks, Sarah. Absolutely. So I'm Sarah Priest, and I've been with Community Action Duluth for almost seven years. And in Duluth, we've got a really awesome story where we actually got the Phoenix rebirth and were able to focus on high-impact innovative strategies to really highlight asset building as a, a strategy out of poverty about um, 14 years ago in 2000. So since then, we've developed these four core areas of our um, agency, financial services and asset development, employment services, community engagement, and then a whole new sector of green jobs. Um, so where should I go from there? We um, have really loved having our IDA program, which is probably the first thing that we were doing um, when we rebirthed ourselves after sort of uh, high-level advocacy and, and work on policy. And so actually one of our loved state association partners, Pam Johnson, was a, a former Community Action Duluth employee, and she kicked off asset development and IDAs in Duluth, and we have run with them ever since. And it's been um, really cool to see hundreds of people come through our doors and enroll with an IDA and then get the uh, financial education portion that is required with that, it's 12 hours. And from there we really expanded because we saw how great it was to empower the folks in the IDA program with financial education um, so we opened up financial education to the broader public, and we started encouraging people to come to us for that service, and then we actually started bringing it to the road, and we took financial education to domestic abuse shelters and places that do chemical dependency work and places that have services um, for ex-offenders or work rehab places, group homes, centers um, for teenagers. So we really took financial education and uh, brought it bigger and better and more bold within our programming. I'm wondering if Angie's back on yet or not. Angie, are you there? Okay, so why don't you keep going? All right. Um, so we really ended up founding a lot of our financial work because in the beginning we were able to get some funding through our state partnership to do the coaching work within the IDAs, but but ultimately, um, you do have to fund that through your own agency. And we found that sort of embedding asset development within a, a housing counseling um, framework was, was best because there were some solid sources of funding. We got our HUD approval status as a housing counseling agency in 2002, and we started getting uh, direct housing counseling funding from HUD in about 2004. Um, again, seeing how asset development uh, could grow in our agency in about 2006, we added um, a free tax prep site through VITA and the IRS, and um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, again, we just kept growing and seeing how important it was to layer on things. So in about 2009, we started with an innovative car purchase program that helps people get access to a reliable newer vehicle with low miles and high fuel efficiency based off of a, a model um, that another communication agency, Westcap, had called Jumpstart. Um, 
again, kept growing. 2012, we started doing prepaid debit cards. And probably before then, our Jumpstart program had a really cool partnership with a credit union. And we were able to innovate and do account openings of savings accounts for people in our offices, folks who were on and under banked who had uh, mistrust or um, familiarity with financial institutions, we could start to build that relationship in our office by opening accounts on site. Um, recently, in the past couple of years, we've been doing um, accounts, but also prepaid debit cards, so getting people access with financial services that way. And then last year, we started with a credit builder loan program that helped people really grow um, their, their credit and, and uh, in, two, in a two-step program of financial, um, like a, a loan and then a secured card the second year after. And that matched their um, payments for their loan with a, a match of their like it was a $25, lo uh, $300 loan, $25 payments, and every time they made an on-time payment, they could get um, a match of that. But I would so say one of the coolest things – yeah, go ahead. I just want to ask you a question. As you guys started, you know, you never mm -hmm. envisioned it would grow in this way. So as you started, and you started with financial education, you started with match savings, you started with FAME, the state um, IDA, AFI-funded IDA program – Kind of what was it in that experience that um, made it possible for you to have a building block with that and then just kind of keep taking steps? Could you respond to that? Well, I think that um, you find ways to make things grow when you see the benefit. Like, so it was really apparent to us how um, much the participants in the IDA program we're getting out of it, like the the tangible increase in income, increase in assets, increase in credit score, like those things were were real apparent. And um, how we just kept going, and sometimes I think we've had this conversation in our office too about um, when there's opportunity, we, we planfully move forward in that direction. So some of that was um, – our community had a Hope Six project, which is a housing development, and it's taking formerly dilapidated public housing and turning it into um, new and often mixed income and sometimes mixed use, so rental and home ownership. And so we had that opportunity in Duluth, and the um, Hope Six funds and our local HRA came in to um, allow us to expand the IDA program specifically to people who were displaced while they were redoing the housing uh, in that Hope 6 project. And so we were able to do IDAs for them for, for home ownership. And I, I believe for uh, the other two assets of, of business and education as well. So sometimes it's just things that kind of fall in your lap, but you realize how important they are. So you're seeking yep. them out. And yep. when they fall in your lap, you say yes every time because it's always going to lead to something better, bigger and better for all involved. Sarah, one last thing before we move on. You've got some unique partnerships. You've had tremendous support from the state CSPG office. You've also brought in other resources. Can you just uh, talk about any of the resources you use to pay for the, the, the uh, working with people side of your work um, sure. and, you know, re ideas you could give to your colleagues in the country? Yeah. So we, like I said, started um, kind of embedding some of this within the housing framework. So being a HUD grantee, getting HUD funding to help support the counseling side of the work. Um, we have partnerships with our local United Way. Um, we also used CDBG, and we're able to use that as some of the support counseling dollars, but also as match. So we created um, IDA specific to home ownership in the city of Duluth through our CDBG allocation. We have some unique partnerships with our county in which we've got some funding for staff through the Family Services Collaborative work, and then we have um, an employment services provider um, contract with the county that enables us to do specific services to African-American families who are on the federal TANF program. Yep. But I would say um, some of the other funding is the, um, the LISC um, yep. Social Innovation Fund that came in in 2011 and really helped to transform our agency from sort of this compartmentalized asset building into a more holistic agency-wide vision of asset development 
and financial services. And so now under a new model of how we do business with the Financial Opportunity Center, we really are, are blending and, and holistically offering these coordinated services between employment and financial, community engagement, and our, our Green Jobs program. It's really coordinated. Um, so those things really helped change. Yeah. And, and, of course, our, our state office um, and our community action association, like they've been fantastic supporters of our work and really just lead the way, I think, I you know, still don't see Angie on yet, but CSBG offered some innovation funds that really helped us um, get going um, probably back in 2007, and maybe we've got another one in 2009, um, helped us do a, a different IDA program, and then also I think our car purchase program were infused with some of this asset innovation funds. So Okay, so here's an example of one agency that started all over again and started with a few, and I mean a few, Individual Development Counts for Home Ownership, Higher Education, and Small Business and Financial Education. And within the span of about 15 years has built on top of each other using various funding sources to keep moving in to be a comprehensive asset building effort. And also you brought in the Federal Reserve, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, the Comp Controller. You've brought in a lot of other resources to your community, not just in the agency, but to the community. We're going, to, right. we're going to move on from here, and thank you so much. We're going to be coming back to you, so please don't go too sure. far. I want to introduce to you a dear colleague of each of us throughout the country whose name is Steve Nagel. Um, Steve is also from Minnesota, and he works with Kate Overson. Um, he's from West Central Minnesota Community Action and um, has been in the community action world as, since a graduate from college as an outreach worker, so it's been a long time. And Kate Overson is the kind of the coordinator of the IDA effort in Minnesota that reaches all 87 counties. And I know we're having a technical challenge. Steve, can we hear you now? Are you there, Steve? No, Steve is not even logged in. Yeah, Steve is here. It's just a, it's a technical thing. So I'm going to go ahead and do this for Steve, and I'm just I'm so sad of our technical challenge here. Um, if Steve gets in, then... Um, uh, you know, cash and let me know. Um, West Central Minnesota Community Action is, a, is an agency in um, kind of western Minnesota. It's, it's got about a $10 million um, budget, and uh, it's a rural community action agency, and it is the grantee of, of a whole network of agencies. There are 23 community action agencies underneath um, the West Central as the grantee for the AFI grant. And um, this whole effort started in 1999, and so far, $4 million has been raised in AFI funds and $4 million in non-AFI funds, which includes um, the state funds from the state of Minnesota and TANF to be able to run this large AFI network. Um, there's enormous support from the State Cap Association, from the State CSBG office. The Brummer Bank System, uh, which provides the banking throughout the state, uh, kind of rewrote software and is able to download the savings information within minutes for all the counties, all the CAPs, all the nonprofits underneath it. And then West Central sends out every month through the network um, statements that show where the savings is, where the match is, how far they have to go. And, and on this next one, um, this whole network has done a lot of innovation, and, and it's kind of scary to, to say this for Steve, but, um, but they, they developed a Four Cornerstones financial literacy curriculum, um, and, and this financial literacy curriculum came out of the, the low-income folks who were in the asset-building effort. And then what happened is that the state CSBG office worked with a big foundation to get funding to do training throughout the state. So, so far, 1,400 frontline workers who are IDA providers, homeless providers, Head Start providers, many other practitioners have been trained in the curriculum and to kind of spread all of that throughout their communities. Um, the University of Minnesota, very, very early on, came on board and helped with evaluation. And they did that as a value add. They didn't get paid for it. It was a partnership. But they created an, kind of a first-ever online financial education certificate for practitioners that cost $250. And the second cohort can sign up from around the country, uh, any of you that may be interested, starting in June. And there's a real certificate for the financial education. We mentioned about the Bremer Banks. 
Um, they electronically go to a central. Um, all the all the banking accounts, all the savings accounts have been negotiated with no minimum balances and no service charges. The banks get Community Reinvestment Act credit for this. Um, in, in one metro area, the CRA officers of a couple of different banks, they convened the funders. So that was a great partnership that, um, that, the, that the CAPS led, really, uh, with these banks. And they convened the funders, and they thought through how to frame um, you know, asset building work that the funders could get and could understand. So instead of knocking on all the doors, the banks convened them. And in another area of the country, the Federal Reserve Bank convened the United Way and the banks to try to fund uh, IDAs and asset building. The subgrantees underneath West Central all have coaches and um, they're paid by various sources, but these coaches have done what Duluth did. They took the financial literacy education into the county prisons and into brown bag lunches for small businesses in the community and have really done a lot in financial capability. Some of the staff did innovations, and they became notaries because they found so many people were unbanked, and those who were unbanked didn't trust the banks. So the staff became notaries to help open up checking and savings accounts for the banks. They became the liaison. And I'm just going to ask Steve if, if he's there. Ah, shoot. He, um, it's a technical problem. I'm just so sorry. But this is an amazing partnership. West Central's got a, partner, a partnership with the Department of Corrections. And um, uh, male prisoners, generally males, who are nonviolent offenders, um, work on the crews to build affordable homes. And um, that's during the day, and then they go back to the, to the county uh, prison at night. And what's happened at West Central in particular is that several of these prisoners, after they left, they got into the IDA program, and they were able to purchase the homes that they helped to build or help, able to purchase other homes. So um, I think if we talked with um, Kate Overson or any of their staff, I think what they're learning right now is that the asset building work has changed their agency, and the network that's built over 15 years is the force at the legislature. They brought stories from the field of people who weren't banked, of um, identity theft and all these things that were really tough. They brought them to the legislature, you know, and the legislature has been taking, you know, appropriate action. So I, I hope, Steve, I've done the best I could do for you and um, and Kate Overson and, and to, just to thank you for your leadership and, and all of your colleagues there in Minnesota. We're going to move now to Mesa Can, and this is Ava Felix, and Ava's a wonderful, wonderful uh, CAP uh, colleague. She's going to talk with you about a different kind of focus that many of you could consider in your communities. And Ava, I want to turn it over to you to tell us about the great work you're doing in Arizona. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Eva Felix. I'm the IDA Administrator uh, for an organization uh, by the name of A New Leaf. Um, it, we are a nonprofit, and I work at the Community Action Program uh, Division, um, which is called Mesa Can. Um, our mission um, of helping families changing lives is in line with our Community Action uh, Association, the mission of improving the lives of families and individuals in the city of Mesa. Um, we at Mesa Can, the site that I work out of, I call a one-stop shop. Um, we offer, uh, like most of the other organizations, additional resources to, to the low uh, and moderate income households that reside in Mesa, uh, utility and rental assistance. Uh, we have financial coaches on site. We are a VITA site uh, throughout uh, the tax season. And uh, like other organizations, are very, very blessed to have uh, funders and partners that, are, that really assist us. Um, as a nonprofit, we've uh, applied for eight total grants commencing in 2001, and very proud uh, today was the deadline to apply for a 2014 grant, and we have, in fact, applied. Um, as an organization um, for um, IDAs, we're very privileged to assist uh, low to modern income households in all three uh, programs, uh, down payment assistance for first-time home buyers, business capitalization, and, of course, the education piece. Uh, during the economic downturn uh, several years ago, we found that a lot of our um, organiz a lot of our participants and or clients that were in other programs found themselves out of jobs. So our educational piece literally took off. Um, we partnered with Mesa Community College, a local uh, uh, community college that was uh, in fact then growing. Um, it's up to 28,000 uh, uh, students, and that piece literally 
took off like a rocket. And we found that a lot of individuals that were in uh, various um, times in their lives now finding themselves without work found themselves in finding the need to go back to school. So Mesa Community College and ourselves, we partnered, and uh, that educational piece then just, like I said, took off like a rocket. Uh, with that growth uh, came uh, very lovely things that happened. Um, the Maricopa Community College School District found that uh, a lot of individuals were, in fact, graduating. I'm very, very proud to say that over 360 um, MCC students have graduated from the IDA program that we paid out to uh, in AFI funds, um, about $60,000 away from paying out about a million dollars at Mesa Community College, I'm very proud to say. With that, we received the uh, uh, Innovation of the Year in 2013, and uh, the Maricopa College Community uh, School District then offered us uh, $500,000 and $100,000 increments to apply for an AFI grant uh, from 2018. Um, with that came uh, the expansion of this, uh, Maricopa College uh, school districts uh, encompass, I think, 10 to 9 community college in efforts to grow that to all the other community colleges. I'm very happy to say that we've uh, brought Glendale Community College in the West Valley now to include that. Uh, with that, um, lovely partners, the uh, Arizona Community Action Association, which is not only a funder, happens to be our CAP association. Um, but provides uh, not only work and utility uh, companies to be brought in and provide us funding, they offer social justice work, um, they offer huge, they're huge advocates at the state level for us and provide board training. Uh, they uh, then partner with us to offer um, foster care uh, youths the opportunity to go back to school and or to go to school and afford that. Um, with that, uh, we have growth to uh, group homes. We partner with the local uh, uh, foundation who offers a group homes to use and those individuals are now in our education piece not only of course children that reside in families uh, they too have been uh, were brought in and have been since uh, from since the inception uh, we're very very happy to say that uh, uh, we offer financial coaching to those that are struggling with their credit score um, we happen to partner with a local credit union that is in-house um, and they offer uh, opening up uh, IDA accounts and also checking accounts to those that are underbanked or unbanked um, in, an, uh, in an opportunity to grow them. Um, with that, uh, we are very, very happy to say that we've also uh, launched an opportunity to assets, which is a non um match savings account to those individuals that don't qualify at 200% of the poverty level. And we're also very, very proud to say that uh, we are launching um, an FOC, which is a financial opportunity center, uh, in efforts to grow um, with the community and offer that to the community um, as we grow. Mm. Ava, let's, uh, um, this is quite a story that you guys have developed here in Arizona. Um, could you just speak a little bit more to the kind of the issues with the, the children or the youth in the group homes and the community colleges and the, and the match that you're going to be able to do? This has become quite a focus for you guys to work with youth, to connect with the community colleges, to get the, the, the uh, foundation that provides the non-federal match so that you can just focus in on these populations. Um, is there anything you can tell us about these young people and their hope and kind of what's happening for them? Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, with uh, with foster care and group homes, uh, most of these children obviously are lacking the parental uh, uh, piece to their lives um, in an effort to offer them not only that, um, they struggle with other issues. And uh, as a nonprofit, we offer uh, um, uh, we kind of wrap our arms around them and assist in, at other levels, um, whether they've got food, um, whether they need uh, maybe to see a therapist. We literally, as a nonprofit, offer 28 different programs that they can touch on. Um, they may also uh, just need to talk to somebody. But most of these uh, youths are are struggling. Um, they're trying to find a job. They're trying to find uh, their place in life. And they don't know how they're going to pay for this. Um, as a nonprofit, we offer them a three-to-one match uh, to attend any community college and or any of our top three uh, universities here um, to Great. enable them to, uh, to handle that burden of paying for the cost of an education. Great. So here's an example of colleagues in the community of an agency that focused, uh, did fill the gap, um, focused in on youth, has a lot of funding coming in to make it happen, and is partnering with the community colleges to make it work. 
and um, and we're going to come back to you, Ava. Just thank you so much. Uh, here's a question that came in quickly. Is partnering with a local scholarship foundation an eligible funding match for education IDAs? And the answer is yes. There are many, many CAPs and others around the country that are um, working with scholarship funds. It's a non-federal source, um, and so that answer is yes. Ava, hold on. We're going to come back to you. These, now, so Ava is an example of a network project. Steve is an example of a network project. And Angie and Sarah are examples of a subgrantee of a network project. Now, this is an example in Sonoma County of a single-site project. And, Terry, I'm going to ask you if you and your colleague Marlene um, could please talk with us about what's going on here. Terry comes from an administrative background, a private sector, not-for-profit sector, um, and, you know, brings all those skills. And, and, and Marlene is the... Um, the IDA coordinator and does business development. They've got unique partnerships happening here and funding sources. Terry, please. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to start by saying that uh, we started initially in 2000 with uh, the IDA program, uh, as it states, in a grant for $50,000. And it was basically financial literacy was the uh, entree into the IDA program. Uh, and through our IDA program, uh, participants had the ability to either save towards a home or secondary education or um, to start a business. And in 2010, the agency uh, started the VITA EITC program here on site. And by 2011, uh, we were also awarded a contract through the county to do SNAP enrollment. And it was after that that I did some research and realized that what we needed to do was bundle all of that and provide um, a one-stop shop for our clients to come in and get uh, work support programs that they needed to achieve some type of stability and, and financial success in their lives. So we started in 2012 with this uh, program we called the Center for Economic Success. Uh, which combined our IDA program, our VITA EITC, our SNAP enrollment program, and uh, we also have a private funder here in Sonoma County uh, that makes about $300,000 a year available for clients that need assistance with their rent or their deposits. So that's all under one roof. And then as the program evolved in 2013, we began to realize that uh, we, we were having a, a struggle getting matches in the IDA program for education and housing. The housing market is really interesting here in Sonoma County. It's uh, very expensive to live here, very expensive to purchase a home and to rent. And so we were a little challenged with that. Uh, somewhat successful with education, but not as much as the micro-business development. That really took off as a result of the, um, you know, the high rate of, of unemployment and just the recession and, and that whole thing. People were looking for alternative uh, methods to supplement their income. Uh, we were also successful in getting funding. We were able to get a three-year grant from a private family foundation to support the program. We've been able to get uh, several banks here locally to support the program. Uh, and we have, uh, this is our second year in getting uh, community development block grant funding from our county to support the micro-business development. And they've also, starting this year, have uh, stated that we can use the CDBG funds as part of the match for our IDA clients that are in our micro-business development program. So we, we are partnering with uh, public and private organizations to fund the micro-business development piece of the Center for Economic Success and our mm -hmm. IDA program. Marlene is going to talk about uh, more specifics on the program and more importantly, our relationship with our one of our local credit unions here, which has really been a boom to the micro business development program. Go. 
Okay, so my name is Marlene Garcia and I'm the program manager for the Center for Economic Success. Um, within this program, I manage the IDA program and I also run the microbusiness development program and teach the class in Spanish. So we offer three sessions every year in English and three sessions in Spanish. Um, usually we have about 15 participants who start the class and usually between 10 and 12 graduate from the class. Because in order to graduate from the class, they need to complete 15 sessions, and we meet weekly for three hours. So, so far, we're going to have be, this is the second year that since we started the program, we started teaching the first class in September of 2012, so it's going to be a year. And we had, for the first class, since the program was new, we didn't have a lot of clients, so we only six people graduated from the first class. And from that class, I have, like, a really great story from one of our clients. So he completed the class and he already had a business in the city of Sonoma. So he had his micro business. He only had one employee. He was making um, not enough money. That's why he decided to start taking the class. So after completing the class, his income increased by 46%. And from he went from having only one employee to having four employees. And this business, he was recycling pallets for the wine industry. So now he's making pallets from scratch and he wants to expand even more and to become a small business and I think that's going to happen probably within one or two years so we're going to be giving more support to this client and other clients and within the micro business development program we not only teach classes we all also provide mentoring for our current clients and also the ones that have already graduated and we also provide the IDA accounts for those that qualify for micro business. And like Terry said, we decided to move from education and and home buying to just fund IDAs for businesses, at least for the last grant that we got. In I think it was two years ago. So we're just gonna for this grant, the fifty thousand dollars is only for businesses. And then maybe in the future we're gonna start doing education and home buying, but not at this point because we have a lot of people interested. In, in the IDA program for businesses, and we want to support our clients that graduate from our micro business development program. Um, and like Terry was saying, we also have a partnership with our local credit union, so they are going to, they set aside a million dollars for our clients, so they're going to be providing micro loans ranging from 5000 to $15,000, and it's only exclusive for our clients, so people from, that even they go to community college and graduate, they get the degree if they want to apply, they won't, they won't qualify because it's only for our clients that successfully complete our program. And at this point, we have three clients that are working with them because this is a new partnership. So they're going to be the first three clients to get a microloan, and that is very exciting. Um, what else? So, Well, Mar Marlene mm -hmm. and Terry, I just want to say to you guys, you have really explained to start with $50,000, to regroup, to refocus, and how you've gotten your city, county, winery, business, banking, credit, I mean, one by one, you have put these partnerships together. And Marlene, I think I remembered you saying that the um, some of the counts coaching for the small business is going to be done by the credit union. So it's going to be a little bit more help into your program. You don't have to put money out for that. You'll get support from the credit union to also do that besides the loans that they make. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. They're going to be providing credit counseling. And also we have a lot of speakers, so a lot of business owners who volunteer come to the class and talk to the students. And they also offer to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring with our clients. Let's say, like, for example, wow restaurant owner, they can mentor someone that want to start a restaurant. So we have wow. a lot. We're working with, you know, our local businesses to support our students, and they're willing to do that because they know that's going to help the economy of the county. Yeah, fantastic. We're going to keep moving. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate your thoughtfulness in trying to help us, you know, learn your story in such a short period of time. Ava, I want to come back to you for a minute. Ava, do you get any support uh, – in, in in the cost of the of the young people who want to learn about what kind of courses they should take, do the community colleges provide any support to you that you don't have to pay for out of your budget? Very good question. Uh, yes, uh, our local community colleges also offer some mentoring uh, to the students to help them uh, maybe find some direction 
uh, without uh, charging us any money or the student, of course. Uh, so as the partnership expands, the services to the participant also expands. Um, like these lovely ladies were saying, uh, it's important that uh, strong partnerships develop um, as you're growing your programs. And uh, we have been very, very uh, lucky to partner with a local, uh, whether it's a credit union, which we house uh, in our site, or big organizations like Wells uh, who hold our uh, our accounts for our participants. Um, if you partner with strong uh, people who believe uh, in your uh, your way of going to help the community at large, um, it's a win-win for everyone. Boy, that was well said, Sarah. I'm going to come back to you for a minute. Is there any and and Steve, you know, and to you too, Sarah, uh, for you and for Angie, are, is there any kind of cost to your amazing efforts that's covered by a partner? that you don't have to find money to pay for? That's a great question. Um, so the the car purchase program is really a, a neat way where we've got some cool partnerships and we have Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota who um, shares in some of the work of um, deciding loan appropriate participants for the program. Um, but I, I don't know that we have the best examples of where we've really been able to pass off a, a true cost. So, a, a true cost. Nice. Are a there any bit. other in-kind costs of space or printing or any other in-kind costs that helps to reduce your cost or, or not? That's fine, too. Not, not really, no. Okay. I'll think on That's it. Great. If I come up with something, I'll let you know. Okay, cool. So I want to just quickly, um, I want to just uh I do know that the same is happening for Steve and many of the CAP agencies that are subgrantees. The cost of doing the first-time homebuyer education is happening with the housing side of the agencies, and the community colleges are providing coaching assistance um, to help people get business plans and help people figure out their education plans, and that, too, is happening through this statewide network. Now, just quickly, because we have to be sensitive to everybody's time, um, these are some other sources of non-federal cash. So financial institutions and their foundations. Um, in in, in uh, Michigan, one of the CAP agencies, I didn't ask his permission, so I'm not going to say who it was, went and negotiated with the state housing finance agency and got the interest off the public funds that were escrowed at the state level as the non-federal match. I thought that was incredibly creative. Tribal governments, United Way organizations, um, of course you know foundations. Some states like Oregon have got tax credits that they can use, um, their state tax credits. There are special needs funding that um, has a self-sufficiency purpose and some of those sources can be used, as, especially if it's state and local, as a non-federal match. We've already talked about state scholarships. Um, companies, I'm aware in the country that an agency um, went to a Home Depot and said, don't you want to start a scholarship program uh, either for your employees or for the community? And the answer was yes. And so this person said, well, we will match it. If you get something going, we'll, do, we'll put a dollar for every dollar. And they were able to do education IDAs that Home Depot was a part of. Um, online do donations, there's one state in the union that um, puts and has permission to do this, uh, kind of the picture of the person that they're going to be able to support as an online donation. Federal home loan banks, escrow funds, um, community, community development block grant is the only federal source that can be used as a non-federal match and for program services, and of course Native American funds. Um, we sent to you, we're not going to go over this, but we sent to you where AFI grantees raise funds and other resources. If you look down that list, that that should tickle some ideas of what's going on for you locally or regionally. Here are some messages that many of the community action agencies use in order to have a talking point and to raise um, an argument for getting support, financial stability, fairness. Uh, if the middle class and the wealthy get tax benefits, the IDA can really help people get ahead. Investment and leverage, your grant or donation or contribution is matched. Opportunity, um, we're not going to go into these, just wanted to offer. You need to think about your project design. As Gretchen mentioned in the beginning, 
uh, on the management and operations side and on the coordination of participant services side. Um, some of your agencies will do all of this. Others of you will have network projects where you divide up these functions. And we're not going to go through them now. You have the PowerPoint. Um, this is an example of a budget. If a, if, a, if a participant gets a one-to-one -one match, and let's say this participant uses the earned income tax credit return and his or her own savings, and they put in 480 in the year, and it's a one-to-one -one match, half of it comes from AFI, half of it comes from other, and you can see at the end of four years they would have a bundle of $3,800 to add to first-time home buyer, um, other small business development, um, and it will reduce the loans for, for an education. Let's look at a three-to-one match. And this is um, an example of a three-to-one match where a participant puts in $40. Half of the match is AFI. Half of it is other. Let's say they're in for four years. They'd have 7600 So you have to kind of work the math. What are the costs? Where do you want to zero in? What do you want to focus in? And then the other thing that I want to ask our participants uh, to do, well, this is a budget. So let's say you want to apply for an AFI grant. And um, the AFI match of, of the match on a three-to-one match coming down to the end here is $288,000. Plus 15%, you may ask for $331,000 $331, in an AFI um, uh, grant application for a three-to-one match. This is just a very small example. But I want to come back to you, Sarah, and to you, Ava, and to you, Terry. Um, in, are there any other um, in-kind? I, I know that some agencies use AmeriCorps volunteers and VISTA volunteers and other volunteers, and they also use um, credit counselors to come into the agency and do some of the credit repair work and are able to kind of cut their costs in that way. This is kind of a last chance for any of you to say, yeah, I forgot to mention that in terms of how to fund our projects. Terry, is there anything else that helps to fund your project in kind or other kinds of um, strategic partnerships that pay for costs or, or do, do, do the um, savers, your participants, use the EITC for deposits? Anything like that? Well, <laughs> One of the things that we implemented this year to kind of help not only offset some of our costs, but we found that we have greater participation if if the participants have skin in the game. So we started charging uh, Good. a client fee. Good. Uh, the, the, the curriculum that we use is it costs about $100 per um, client, and we can't copy it or anything. They have a copyright on it. So we have to purchase that. Outright. And if you charge them, do they stay in the classes? Is there more commitment if there's a yes. charge? Yes. Okay, good. I'm going to keep moving, Terry, and thank you for that. Sarah, anything for you? Is there anything else as we've ticked off these lists that you use to help fund any of your efforts? Well, I would definitely say AmeriCorps is certainly a program that can help, and we have a, a nice history of being able to then hire many of our AmeriCorps workers, and most are our um, regular AmeriCorps, but we in the last year had a VISTA, and that uh, person worked a lot on ex-offender issues and on building partnerships with employers so that the income piece of the whole financial stability is, is there's a pathway that's been built, and that's been really yeah. helpful, but certainly AmeriCorps is a, is a huge resource. Good. Thank you so much, Sarah, and I just want to thank all of our speakers. We want to thank our friends at the National Community Action Partnership. If any of you are interested more, um, there's a project builder online. There's a toolkit. These are the webinars that um, Gretchen referred to. Um, this is where you can go for getting some technical support for your applications. Think about all the asset tools, and we just want to thank you. We will absolutely take your questions on the right here and get answers and send them out. Uh, Cashin, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, that about covered it. I did want to uh, remind people, um, as Denise just mentioned, that we are collecting all of them. So if we did not get to your question, uh, we, we are collecting those, and we'll try to get uh, those turned around. Um, we've had several people that have put questions in um, about, yes, this is recorded. It uh, will be available probably tomorrow, um, and the slides will also be posted. So um, if you wanted to go back and, and look at any of these as resources, uh, yes, those will be available. We'll send out a, a follow-up email tomorrow letting you know um, whether that is up or not. 
And well, last but not two, cash and cash and hold on. Uh, we sent each of you, thankfully, preparing an AFI application slideshow. If your staff just goes through that and answers those questions, you're going to be 99% there. Cash and back to you. Sure, and yes, we did. Um, if you were registered prior to today, um, we did send out an email this morning with the slides and, and a couple of those resources. So if you uh, did not see that, you are welcome to email me when we get done with this. That's cyiu at communityactionpartnership.com, or you can reply back when we do that follow-up email, and we'll make sure that you get those materials as well. Uh, my last uh, note here is that there will be an evaluation that will pop up when we uh, close down today's event. So do let us know uh, what you thought about this topic, um, how, how did this go, and uh, what would you like to see from us um, in the future. So closing words from you. Thank you so much, everybody. Good luck in, in the impossible work you do in your communities. What you do makes a difference. It's just unbelievable. I know the CAP world well, and just enormous respect for your challenges, your opportunities, and, and the kind of hope that you represent to people. And happy 50th anniversary year. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.